Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe during the stay at home uh, order that's been in place uh, for some time. I am incredibly, incredibly excited about our special guest today, joining us for the Social Talk with the Doc series for my sociology classes at Los Angeles Harbor College. We have Sara from the Shaws of Sunset joining us. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for even reaching out to me. When you told me it was for your college students, I was like, I'm the biggest proponent of education. I was like, I absolutely would love to. So I'm, I, I'm glad we spoke before this so that we kind of can give them something that, you know, they'll find insightful and that they can take away from. Yeah, definitely. Now, in sociology, we talk about the sociological perspective. And the sociological perspective is essentially this idea that we enter new interactions or social situations with a blank mind, with an empty canvas. And we see the Shaws of Sunset, me being a huge fan of the show, and I see one image of Sara being shared on the screen. And the reason why I wanted to connect with you today is to really understand who is Sara? What makes you, you? And so once again, I appreciate your time. And I want to start off discussing your parents' immigration story. Uh, I found it incredibly inspiring. And if you don't mind just filling in people about uh, their story and where they came from and you know, life in the United States. Sure, I think it's a great starting point. You know, um, my parents are from Iran, we're Persian. So they, you know, they both come from you know, decent families in Iran. They had kind of everything made for them you know, when they were in Iran, but they wanted to come to this country for the opportunities and for the education system that this country provides. And they wanted that for themselves. They wanted that for them, their children. And that was very, very important. You know, education, I think a lot across a lot of cultures is very important and especially amongst Persians. And so I, you know, my parents came here, they, had, they were young. They had five children and, you know, I remember my dad, they didn't even buy a car yet. You know, English was the second language. They were kind of just learning. And I remember my dad, we were in Oregon. He went to Oregon State University and he used to ride his bike to school and to get his PhD actually. So to get even a higher education degree, you know, and, you know, before anything, that was what in his mind he felt like was the most important thing to do if he was going to provide and give a life to his family in this country. And, you know, I, I think that was just something that I always, one of my first memories and thinking like, wow, you know, when I look back on it, it's something that, you know, definitely sticks out in my mind. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're the, the, the story of your parents, your parents' immigration story is so relatable. There are so many students that I have in my sociology classes and at Los Angeles Harbor and other community colleges where I've taught that have a similar story, a, a, a story of perseverance, a yeah. story of, of determination to focus. And I assume that your parents came to the United States because they understood all of the opportunities that the United States could offer their children. Absolutely. So you go from living in Oregon where your dad's going to graduate school to now living in the state of Indiana. And what was it like growing up in Indiana? I've never been to Indiana. I think most of my students have never been to Indiana. Can you provide some insight into uh, what life was like? Nothing like LA. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm very grateful that I grew up there because I think, you know, growing up in the Midwest, there's just such good values. And there was just, it was, I got, I'm glad I grew up there for sure. But, you know, what I did feel it lacked more than anything is diversity and culture, you know. And so it was hard, you know, being a Persian girl. Persians weren't necessarily represented in the media at that time, you know. And so I really had nothing to kind of identify myself with. So when I was at school, I was very, I was like, I mean, I was pretty much my whole life extremely westernized. But, and so at school, I'm an American girl, you know through and through. And then when I come home, I'm a Persian girl through and through. So, it, you know, I, I was like half and half. And I was always trying to walk a fine line between that because my parents still, like, they led a very strict Persian household. And, you know, girls in Iran, they're, you know, the way they're brought up, it's strict. It's not as lenient as for the guys, you know. So for a, 
a young girl in Indiana, no culture, no diversity, nobody in the media that I could identify with that was similar to me. Um, it was definitely a challenge, you know? I was just trying to, I was, all I cared about was everybody else, appeasing everyone else. It was never really about me, myself, you know? Just being a young girl, I think women kind of get their voice over time, you know? You made an incredibly powerful statement. And I use the word incredibly, if you noticed multiple times, because I think it's such a powerful word. And the statement that you made about this dual identity and this idea that in the United States, people of ethnic and racial minority status oftentimes have to have this dual identity, the identity at home among our loved ones and close friends and the identity that we show in public. And this idea that we have this constant desire, perhaps not consciously at times, to want to fit in, to want to be accepted. Because when we look at what America defines as, you know, the proper way to speak English, the proper faith to follow, um, how we should dress, how we should look, oftentimes it doesn't relate to our cultures and it doesn't relate to our identities. And so that being said, I want to gain an understanding of, you know, your self-concept, your self-identity. And when did that really develop? When did you learn to embrace Sara and start to embrace your culture and your faith? I mean, I was always embracing my culture at home through and through, but um, I think in public maybe, you know, and it's not that I was acting like something I'm not because I was, I was living in this country and I was Persian too, and I was both, you know, yeah. but when I, it didn't really, I didn't really like want to, embrace my you know Persian side as much until I went off to college and I started to experience and a lot more diversity in culture at the, you know when I went off for my college experience it's funny because now I'm out of the house I'm away from like you know the my Persian home and now I'm like actually experiencing it uh, even more and I it was really once I went off to my like to college yeah so you go to college, you go to Indiana University, yeah, and you study business there, and you make that transition to the United States, I'm sorry, to, I said to the United States, to the state of California, and to Los Angeles specifically. Um, what led you to Los Angeles, and what was that transition like? Um, you know, after I was done with college, I... I just, I just knew, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I didn't, I had ideas for like things I wanted to do, but I didn't know for sure. I just knew that, you know, I, I didn't need to build, I knew I could get it out of LA rather than staying in Indiana. And I want, I was done with school. I was starting to build my life. And, um, so I was just like, well, I need to move. I need to get out of here because I don't see a future for myself in Indiana. And it took a lot of courage. You know, I worked for a year straight after college. I think I worked like two jobs. I was working like 60 hours a week, saving every penny I could. Cause I was like, I don't know what I'm getting into when I get out there, but I need to like have some cushion. I need to, I'm going out there and I'm going to figure it out. You, it was really hard to try to like find a job from Indiana, have, get that apartment set up. I was like, I just got to be ready. I don't know. So it was, it was definitely, you know, I just, I just packed my SUV and did it. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. How many million people do it? How many people move to LA and figure it out? Like, I'm going to figure it out. And it was hard. It was definitely hard. Um, but it was the best decision of my life. Yeah, when we spoke, me, yo, yeah definitely. Definitely. Now, when we spoke uh, earlier today, uh, you shared a very, very personal story with me uh, about your family and the losses, the tragic loss of your father. Yeah. And when we spoke, you talked about, you know, a story about your mother going back to school, yes. uh, despite having five children at home that she needed to support. Um, can you share a little bit about that story? And in addition to that, um, do you mind sharing where your work ethic comes from? Yeah. Um, you know, my work ethic comes from my parents because they were hard workers. Um, my work ethic comes from like when I was 
when I was, my first job was when I was seven years old, you know, I went from age of seven to 11. Um, and it probably would have continued had we not moved out of the neighborhood. I was a paper girl. I delivered the newspaper every day after school. And, you know, in Indiana, it snows, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that easy. I don't know why I was doing it, but I, you know, older sisters that worked and I wanted to be like them, you know, and I think every girl wants to be like her older sister. And I, you know, and also I had this like relationship with my dad where I would give him my check and we had this, um, like a bank account. And so I would give him my check and I would have my balance and whenever I wanted something like where I would be like, dad, I need $20 and going to the movies or something, you know, we would withdraw it from my account and I started to learn the value of a dollar. And a lot, a lot of the reason why I wanted to work is because my parents did they worked so hard and they had so many kids and I just felt like if I wanted what I wanted or whatever I wanted for myself I you know how am I gonna get it you know what I mean and so um you know if you're one in five kids and you ask your parents for something you gotta kind of like be at their mercy so I was kind of I just wanting to be more self-reliant at an early age I think that um I don't know that was just it's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't like my dad was like, you have to have a paper out and make money. It's not like that. It was something that I think when he knew I wanted to do it, he felt like, well, this might not be so bad to uh, like a learning thing for you. Yeah, definitely. And if you don't mind touching on the story uh, with your mom. Sure. So, you know, when I was 14, um, my father had passed away in like a just freak car accident out of nowhere. And he was dropping me off at work. And so he passed away two minutes after he dropped me off. And I felt a lot of guilt for that because even though it wasn't my fault, I couldn't have predicted that to happen or anything like that. Um, but, you know, naturally, I think you, you feel very guilty. Like if I didn't have to work that day, my sisters would still have their dad. My brother would have his dad. My mom would have her husband. So, you know, because of that, and I, I just did not want to be more of a burden to my mom so I it gave me even more of a push to be more self-reliant and stuff in that circumstance but I remember my mom um you know she in that moment of tragedy in that moment of crisis and everything like that no matter what decision she would have made you you know I'd have to commend her either way you know there's no judgment on that but I remember she decided to go back to school to become a nurse and you know she's English is a second language. She's in the middle of nowhere. She has a broken heart, five kids. She can't speak English uh, like that well to like go to now nursing school and stuff. And she decided, I don't care. I'm going to struggle for a few more years, but I have to take care of these kids. She could have just picked us all up and went back to Iran. She had family and, you know, but she said, no, you know, I'm going to carry out my husband's wish to give these kids the opportunity that this country provides and the education here. I know that's what he would want. And she did it. And I, you know, I have so much respect for her from that because I remember how hard it was, but she just did it, man, like a trooper. I love her for that. Yeah, very selfless, you can argue. Because, very, I mean, very, having everything, I have one son who's seven years old and I can only imagine, you know, having five children and trying to balance everything and then let alone go back to school. I mean, yeah. that, that's such an inspirational story. Now, when we were talking, you shared um, you know, a conversation that you had with your mom when you told her, Hey mom, I'm moving to Los Angeles regarding your education. Um, and, and I, I think, you know, it, it's a testament to the importance of education. And if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what she told you or what she encouraged you to do, uh, during so, that transition. I knew I was moving to LA. Um, I knew I was moving to LA, but, uh, my mom just said, you know, Sarah, like, you're going to move to LA. You know, I can't really stop you. You're an adult now. You have your degree, but you, my mom really wanted to make sure I got my graduate degree. And she said, if you move to LA, you just have to promise me one thing. You promise me that you will, once you get on your feet and get settled there, you will get your MBA. They won't let that town, you know, yeah. you, you know, distract you. And I was just like, I promise if that's all you're asking of me, I promise. And so, yeah, she was just like, okay, as long as you promise you're going to do that, then you can go even though I was going to go, but you know, at least she had my blessing. I mean, yeah, at least she had her blessing. Yeah. And so interesting, right. That, you know, no matter how old we get, our parents are still keeping that watchful eye over us and are still concerned. Uh, you know, you, you talked about how you were in corporate America, yeah. right. And the fact that you come to Los Angeles, you start building your career. And that's one of the top priorities for your mom. And same thing with my parents, right. 
say, uh, top priority, get your education. Right? Yeah. It's like, mom, dad, I already have one master's. Well, get another master's. Go get your doctor, whatever it may be, right? Because yeah. they want to make sure that. Right now, if I get my PhD, I'm like the most, the baddest girl in the world. <laughs> she tries to like, you know, get me thinking like that. She's like, sorry, just go get your PhD. You would be, so, oh my, if you, you would beat your sisters if you get your PhD. <laughs> and she, competition, she's like, nobody can say anything to you if you get your PhD. I'm like, mom, I think I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> That's um, awesome though, but it's so funny. So like, play with my head <laughs> yeah definitely so so you enter uh you know corporate america um you start doing well um as a career and then um you know something happens and your mindset changes as far as your career goals goes and can you talk a bit a little bit about that um sure. you know what changed yeah. so i just kind of had a I kind of plateaued in my career, you know, I had an incredible career and I loved my job and my, what I was doing at the time. I did it for seven years. I was doing business development, um, in for medical practices in Beverly Hills. And like, I was so proud of it. I was growing. I was, I was proving a lot to myself that I can do this role. I didn't know that I could at first and I was doing it well. And, you know, I, it did a lot for me. So I'm not ungrateful for it or it wasn't something I regret. But, you know, after so long, you know, I felt like I was kind of outgrowing it again. And at the, after so long, it was just about money for me. It wasn't, there was nothing else other than money. And I, there was no more promotions because I didn't want any more roles in the office within that, those companies. So I was just like, at what point is money not the end all be all? I really just was not happy. And I, I found myself every day just not being happy. I felt like I was wasting my life. It was time to move on. And I just, you know, even though it was wonderful for many, many years, it afforded me the ability to do a lot and to get my MBA and do all these things. So I'm grateful for it. But you know, after a while, I was like, it's time to move on. I wasn't happy anymore. I didn't feel like I was living up to my full potential. I felt like I was getting complacent. And um, yeah, I just knew it was, it was really, it was a big, big risk to leave corporate America, leave all that insurance and, you know, that steady check, the, all that. It was very, very hard. But I was like, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? I'm wasting again, wasting my life. <laughs> What's my passion? What's my purpose? What am I going to do? And so it was a lot of that going on in my mind and a lot of like inner turmoil. Yeah. You know, what I find fascinating about your, your story that you shared with me in our multiple conversations is this idea that as I begin to analyze our conversations, mm -hmm. obviously you're a go-getter, right? Obviously you're someone who's highly motivated, but you're also yeah. someone who is not afraid to take that leap of faith. If it's leaving yeah. the comforts of your home in Indiana to move to Los Angeles, the comforts of a secure job to pursue your passions, right? What, what contributed to that? Like what leads you to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna take this leap of faith because I can tell you, me personally, I don't think I, maybe moving out of state, I've done that before, I moved to Vegas for a job, but I already had a job set out there. But I don't know if I could just all of a sudden, you know, pause my career and then yeah. go and, and pursue my passions. So I'm trying to understand what, what, what has led to that mindset? I don't know. You know, I've always been very ambitious. You know, I really just have, I mean, having a job at seven, when I was in high school, I was working, going to the community college, you know, working a couple jobs. Like I just always, I always had this idea for my life. And when I came here in the first, the, what I did for seven years, although that was kind of a, you know, I always had this idea of having this corporate job in a big city and all that, that was a part of it. But it was, I also felt like I picked the safe route in a lot of ways. Even when I got my MBA, I was like, am I picking really my, the most passionate thing? And so I, I always kind of battled with this. I did what was I felt safe, but at the same time, I did make these really courageous decisions and stuff. And I think now I can speak to it, but I, at the time, I don't know. It just felt like I felt very passionate about doing those things because I just wanted to really like live my life to the fullest and not have any regrets. You know, I just always kind of thought that way. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, now, you know, I have students and my students range from 17, 18 years old, all the way to 60 something. A uh, vast yeah. majority of my students are in their mid twenties. And, you know, they're trying to navigate those waters. They're in jobs right now and going to school part-time or full-time and trying to figure out, you know, who am I? What do I want in life? And yeah. what advice would you give to college students, having been an undergraduate student as well as a graduate student, and having, you know, transitioned from career to a different, from one career to another career, what advice could you provide uh, students? You know, that's the thing. When I left my corporate job and stuff, I really, I went on this, this journey and this spiritual journey, this professional, like, that I just went in like a lot of self-reflection. I was like, who am I? After all that I've done, I'm still like, who am I? Who is Sarah? What does she want to do? What is her dream? What is her passion? And all this stuff. And I think I remember watching something Oprah said, and she said, if you don't know what your calling is, if you don't know what your passion is, if you don't know what your purpose is, that's the first thing you need to do. You need to figure that out, you know? I wouldn't necessarily have changed my path because I think it all led me here. Um, but if I was, when I would what I would tell uh, probably somebody younger, um, the question was what, what, if they're, what was the question? You know, it's the so, idea that many of my students have come from very diverse backgrounds. They're working, they're going to school. They're trying to find themselves. And what yeah. advice would you give them to take that leap of faith? Oh, okay. I would say definitely, uh, is the, I think the difference is, is if you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it comes down to. Because I remember when I was out here in LA and I was in my career, and I, I met people that were very, very successful in their industries. And they were normal people, you know, it wasn't that they were just lucky as they were normal people. And the difference was that they just believed in themselves and they were willing to, you know, take the first step, um, into the direction that they want. You know, sometimes I think for a lot of people, they think they have to have everything planned out and stuff like that. Sometimes it's just the first step and things will start to fall in place and then the next step. And so I think really it's just believing in yourself and knowing that, you know, you, you can do it. And I know it's something so small and sounds so just like, oh, give me a break. But it's true. Like when you have faith that you can really do, I mean, you're going to go to work your whole life for somebody else, you know, and build their dream. Why can't you put the same energy and effort in yourself? And it might be difficult at first. Absolutely. It was difficult for everybody, you know, and I think people only hear about it when everything is successful and done and this and that. But it, everybody has a journey and stuff like that. And that's what, this, what life's about. And that's what makes it so sweet is, is the journey. If you got everything tomorrow and didn't have to work for it, I mean, would you, I mean, would you value it? No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, um, I've expressed my love for the Shaws of Sunset and it's more than just a TV show and the way the show's, uh, you know, arranged and all that. It's really the representation of Persian Americans. Something yeah. that, you know, throughout the history of television, we haven't really seen. In my yeah. sociology classes, we talk about, you know, how we begin to divide individuals or classify individuals within our society. And you see whites, you see African American, you see Latino Hispanic, you see Asian, and then the other category. While the other categories made up of millions and millions of people. And to see the Shahs of Sunset with a full cast of Persians in my opinion, is incredibly powerful. Um, now, does it reflect the everyday lives of Persian Americans? Well, maybe not, but representation is key. And so what does it mean to you to be part of this cast and to be one of the, you know, one of what, seven individuals on TV yeah. that are representing Persian Americans in American society? It's, oh my God, I don't have words. Honestly, I don't take it lightly. I, I think it's, wow. You know what I mean? Being a, a girl from Indiana, you know, not, I mean, visiting Iran, but like, you know, I just think, wow, I understand, you know, what it means. I definitely understand what it means. Not that we are the perfect Persians, you know, and, and we're not trying to be, but that, you know, and that it's not that, but I think like, I remember when I was, like in the Midwest, a Persian girl going to school in Fort Wayne and like 
there was nothing I could look at that I, I could identify, you know, and when we're on, on shots, we're all different, you know, and that's what makes the cast and the group and the, that we all have different viewpoints and we're all different. And that's what it's supposed to be. None of us are supposed to be just alike. And, you know, if I was growing up in Indiana and I was able to turn on the TV and see something that kind of I could identify with a little bit, I mean, I feel like that would have been very valuable for me. You know what I mean? I do. And I, I, it's something that I think is just, just honestly an honor. I know it's like just reality TV and I don't want to make it more than what it is, but like, I, I understand what it means for Persians and this and that. And I think it's just, it's really cool, you know? And, um, yeah, I remember even like when I was a few, maybe just like a few years ago, I met somebody and I was in actually in Atlanta one day. And I met somebody and I was like, oh, I'm Persian. And they were just like, oh, you're like, and they like named one of the cast members. You're like that person from Shaw's. And I was just like, I mean, that's how you can identify us. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, cause that was, that person has no concept of Persians or anything like that without the show. And so it's nice that, you know, the show is there to kind of give us some representation in this country. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of my favorite things about the Shaw's is that you hear, I believe it's Farsi at times being yeah. spoken. I mean, how, yeah. where else would you see that on television? And I think that's so, it's such a beautiful language. Um, I think it's so amazing that it's included in the show because we see yeah. so many television shows where, you know, now we're starting to see more Latino Hispanics on television, but you never hear Spanish being spoken. Right, you start to see more uh, uh, individuals from different groups on television, and they're more stereotypical roles. And there's a degree of authenticity associated with the Shaw's of Sunset that I really appreciate as not only a viewer, but also as a sociologist. And as I mentioned to you, uh, between Family Karma and Shaw's of Sunset, uh, those are examples that I use in class. And I know that a tremendous amount of my students are huge fans of the Shaw's of Sunset. And I wanted to thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate your willingness to connect with my students. Um, and I wish you the best of luck in everything that you do. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. I appreciate it. I hope your students get something from this. And, you know, I was a student one time too. So like, I know these <laughs> classes can get dull sometimes, but that's why I wanted to call you before and make sure we made it as, you know, insightful for them as possible. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, enjoy this hot summer day, even though we're kind of limited in what we can do. But, <laughs> but have a great time and stay safe. You too. Thank you so much. Have right, a good thank one. you. All right, take care.